Uber CEO Dara Kazushaki in a new op-ed. He's casting doubt on the company's goal of being emission-free in the U.S., Canada, and many European cities by 2030. And we want to talk about this because he writes the following. The stark reality is that Uber will not reach our zero-emission goals without stronger action from policymakers and businesses. Unfortunately, right at the moment, we need to accelerate through the turn. Many governments and automakers are slowing down. We should also mention a new Axios report this morning that Uber is working with Tesla to encourage drivers to switch to EVs, and we want to talk about all of that. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you. So tell us about what led to this op-ed and the way you're thinking about this issue now. Well, I think we what is absolute is that we are totally committed to electrification of our fleets, right? We talked about by 2030 in the U.S., Canada, Europe, 2040 all over the world. But what I've always said is that climate is a team sport. There's no individual company or individual right. person who can drive the climate agenda forward. You need companies, governments, individuals to come together. And for us, we are building out the economic flywheel, essentially, of incentivizing our drivers to switch to EVs. Right. They've got to be affordable. They've got to uh, have great repair uh, uh, kind of profile. And they need charging infrastructure as well. And the charging infrastructure, for example, is something that's vital right. that governments and cities play a part in. So this is what we've seen is we've gone from a period of excitement to a period of execution. And, and you stories are easier to say right. than the actions are. And so now here, gotta leave. here we are, though, and it appears that there's a lot of folks who are scaling back. I mean, there yes. are a lot of people who made big pledges, uh, big uh, you know, big numbers about what they were going to do. Now we see a, a sort of major pullback. Where Do you feel like you're in that pullback? We continue to lean forward, but we see the pullback. And, and, and I think that the key is that for us, we view electrification as good business, right? So when you look at our riders, about 40% of our riders now, for example, in the U.S., have been in an EV. And they love the product. Their average tips are higher for the driver. So the driver's who got to an EV, our take rate is lower, so they're making more money from us. They're making more money because the tips are higher. And so both drivers and riders love what we're seeing. But then, per Tesla, we've got to go out to OEMs and get them to lower prices and make it more and more affordable for drivers to make that switch. Yeah, I would say a lot of the pullback is coming from places where there's not demand. I mean, some of these, like in Hertz, the reason they're getting rid of them is because nobody wanted to rent them. Uh, the car makers that are dialing down on it, because nobody wants to buy them. Like, well, no one wants to buy them, let's say, because it's the right thing to do. They want to buy them if the product is great. Yeah, but it doesn't, okay, so for drivers, for urban, it doesn't make sense for an urban dweller who doesn't have somewhere to plug in the, the vehicle. Uh, absolutely. And, and that's why, for example, charging infrastructure, making charging infrastructure available to that urban dweller or to our drivers right. who might not have their own uh, garage, et cetera, becomes all the more important. So nobody said this was going to be easy, right? This is right. one of the biggest challenges that humanity is facing. And taking that on isn't going to be easy. And, and, you know, we want to keep pushing forward uh, through this more difficult time. And we're totally committed. A driver that's driving for you eight hours a day, 10 hours yeah. a day in an electric vehicle, can they make it throughout the whole day on one charge? They can make it on one charge. And what we do is we help them in terms of what's the right time to charge, for example. The right time is low demand time. Right. We'll find you an open charger. The data needs to be good. The charger right. needs to be not broken. Right. Uh, and we'll find you what the price is, et cetera. So there's a whole system that you have to build in order to enable all this to come together. But again, there's an infrastructure that we're depending on, and governments need to keep leaning into that infrastructure. Let me ask you about a separate uh, topic that came up uh, in the news while we've been at Davos. Uh, Drizzly, an yes. acquisition that, the, that you made, uh, an alcohol delivery company, mm -hmm. uh, effectively, you shut it down. You spent spent three billion dollars on it. Was that a acquisition that you now think was a mistake? Well, we shut down the app. We haven't shut down the service. OK, so what we saw and we're increasingly seeing is we talk a lot about the power of the platform. And what does that mean is people like coming to a single app that knows them, knows their identity, payments, details, et cetera. And we bought Drizzly and we essentially started building in alcohol delivery into the Uber East platform. Uh, getting all the merchants in place, having all the inventory, building the right catalog, et cetera. There, there's right. a lot of detailed work that, that went into it. And after a while, what, what we saw is a lot of Drizzly customers who used Uber Eats 
They just, the second time around, they used Uber Eats for alcohol delivery. The same thing is true for grocery as well. We had Corner Shop. We shut that down. It, it is a disciplined thing to do right. in a market that requires discipline, but more and more, it shows the power of the platform, which is consumers but, but want you look at that as a deal. It? Did you need that to make the jump to get people to buy Uber Eats? You know, it's... Um, to buy alcohol on I don't rates. think we necessarily needed it, but it committed us, and it committed us to move faster to build this one app for every delivery need that, that you need. So it's worked out for us in the end, and alcohol delivery is one of the fastest-growing parts of, of our business, uh, but it wasn't working as a standalone. And that's one of the challenges that a lot of these smaller tech companies that are private who can't get funded anymore is because... These small standalone use cases don't justify the returns on capital, but putting these products inside an Uber and Uber Eats, that makes a lot of sense. We keep talking about AI. I mean, you can't get, you know, you can't move without it's talking a about AI. question. Here. I can't believe it took that long. So mm -hmm. how is AI being used in practice today inside of Uber? So first of all, the, you know, AI is a big word, but there are many different kinds of AI, right? So we've been using AI to price out your ride to... Uh, power your feed on Uber Eats uh, to figure out the right, right. route to decide. Well, will what, you charge what, me a different amount than you charge Becky for the exact same ride, same same moment? Uh, moment, not, moment. not the same ride, uh, same moment. Uh, no, no. Let's say you think yeah. that it's more, that, that because you could test this. Yeah. Am I a more elastic customer? In terms, will I pay more? Meaning, meaning to, am I willing to pay a higher yeah. premium than maybe Becky is? Or maybe Becky is... Probably not. You know, I'm, the cheap, <laughs> I'm the cheapest. <laughs> we, Probably not. We, so, don't, we, we, we don't price, price based on individuals, okay. but we do you, price based on routes. Okay. So, for example, you're taking a route from the suburb to the city. Right. We may know that there aren't that many alternatives, so you might be less elastic in terms of price sensitivity. Uh, but, but we're very, very careful not to take individual kind of pricing in, right. into account. Now, with the drivers, for example, some drivers, uh, a promotion might incentivize them to drive more than other drivers. So in promotions, et cetera, it might, but not, not in terms of pricing. Coming back to AI for a second, the new version of AI, which is generative AI, we're very focused on, for example, productivity uh, uh, measures, helping our developers be more productive in writing code. Our customer service agents provide better service once they, right. you know, summary of what they're doing, what the rules are, et cetera. So it is very, very early in the path. But uh, I do think that properly used Gen AI uh, will be a huge productivity uh, saver for companies all around the world, not just tech companies.